um, financial professional, and we're going to be delivering this month's uh, monthly market update. And uh, I'm glad you've chosen to spend a little time with us. I'm going to uh, minimize my camera here so that you can see the screen clearly, and um, we'll get started with our program. Uh, as we said there, um, I'm Mark Trice. I am a um, financial professional, an investment advisor, uh, financial planner. We have offices in throughout Central Texas and West Texas in uh, Waco, Austin, Temple, and out in Brownwood. But of course, a number of our clients work with this virtually all around the country. So if you have questions, you can give us a call or send us an email. You can send that email to info at clearvistafinancial.com. We'll put that on the slide towards the end of our program today. Uh, or you can give us a call at 800-491-4508. So today we're going to talk about, you know, how the first quarter went and review how close we came to a bear market. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what the majority of the industry does, how we do it a little bit differently, and maybe give you some food for thought on how ways that you can manage your own portfolio. So um, headline here from the Wall Street Journal, stocks on pace for the worst quarter in two years despite a strong finish in the last two weeks. And what we're seeing there is that um, you know, oil at one point Oil futures were up to about $130 a barrel, and that level flashed a warning signal for many, many economists. Uh, but since that's declined to around $105 a barrel, and that price likely limits immediate economic damage. We think we can handle that, but it's still, there's some that are uh, forecasting that that price of oil will go up to $150 to $200 a barrel. Now, many commodities are experiencing really what I would call irrational volatility beyond energy, and that includes aluminum, nickel, wheat. All these things are going to uh, been behaving very erratically, and that also makes it very dangerous to invest in, the, in them as a commodity. Then you've seen headlines where Meta, which is the former Facebook, Netflix, PayPal, they have drugged down the S&P 500 index with the worst quarter for those type of companies since 2012. And so, you know, we see the picture in the headline here of this article. Uh, Meta wiped out probably uh, $232 billion in market value in a single trading session in February. That's how crazy things have been. So uh, looking at uh, performance of the S&P 500, this is an index we measure. First quarter, the S&P 500 was down 4.95% through the end of the quarter, which was on Thursday. And uh, at its worst, we saw the S&P 500 index uh, fall as much as 13.7%. And that was from the peak in January, on January 4th to March 8th, which was the latest, uh, the lowest bottom that we had. And you can kind of see on this chart that we saw the S&P begin Got, begun, began to form a bottom. And that bottom um, really started to form here on, on the end of February and really uh, in the first couple of weeks of March, uh, we started seeing that and uh, we've seen a, a, a gradual, a ra rather rapid increase in the last two weeks, you know, only to have it pull back in the last few days of the quarter. So, you know, the S&P 500 has not made it back up to its previous highs on January 4th. And in fact, we are down 4.95% in the first quarter. And then after um, this week, that'll go down a little bit further. Uh, so the NASDAQ, what about the NASDAQ? This is the, typically has a lot of tech companies in it, the NASDAQ Composite Index. First quarter, we saw the NASDAQ close down 9.1%. And it, at its worst uh, point on March 14th, uh, we saw the NASDAQ pull back as much as 22.5%. And so that's 
that's very uh, very significant. We started seeing the Nasdaq form bottoms in late February um, and mid January. Um, that would would constitute a 22.5 percent decline from peak to trough. Would constitute um, a more significant change in the dynamic of the markets. The Russell 2000 index, uh, these are typically smaller companies, smaller public, public companies. That was down 7.7% in the first quarter from peak to trough on November 8th through February 24th. Uh, we've seen that pull back as much as 23%. Uh, that is indicative of, of a larger breakdown in that index as well. Uh, just because we've had a little bit of a bounce, there are things known as bear market rallies. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Now, the long-term treasury. This is the one that we talked about on, the, on our radio program today about how dangerous this is because so many people own bonds in their portfolio. And what we're seeing is, is that we're seeing the yield curve, which is the, the curve that plots individual interest rates uh, over different time frames, so a two-year treasury, a 10-year treasury, and so on out to 30-year treasuries. And we're seeing that, that normally that's a, on the lower end of the duration of, say, a two-year, the, the interest rates are smaller versus a longer term where it tend to be larger uh, yields, but we're seeing that invert. And what that means is, is that for a brief moment this last week, we had the yield on a two-year treasury being higher than a 10-year treasury, and that is quite significant. What historically that has shown is, is that sometimes, sometimes is a precursor to a re economic recession. Now, uh, as many times that it has signaled that, it was momentary and uh, did not really result in recession, and typically when that does flash that sign, it might be 12 to 15 months before we see the economy go into a recessionary stage. So we're not forecasting a recession. We think it's it's possible uh, that the risk for a recession is greater now given the higher interest rate, higher interest rates, high inflation, creating a stagflation environment. We think that's possible, but um, that did happen this week. And so from peak to trough, that's in de early December through March 25th, uh, we saw the, the long-term treasury bond index decline by 17%. Now, historically, what the typical financial advisor will tell you is, is that if you want to avoid risk, you put your money, more money into bonds versus stocks. Well, we've already seen that stocks have gone down quite a bit, but so have bonds. We have been taught by academia and the, the industry, financial industry that bonds and stocks are not correlated. Well, guess what? They are, uh, as we've seen in the last several uh, bear markets in recessions that in fact treasury or long-term bonds and stocks typically have become more and more correlated. And so you have to watch out for that because safety going to bonds may not be a safe place at all. And so here's kind of the macro view of what we're seeing right now. These are um, macroeconomic sectors and we're kind of ranking them on their relative performance. What you see up here at the top is real estate is tends to be the top performing uh, asset class necessarily. Energy is doing very well, but you're also seeing that cash in the last few weeks um, has really fallen out of favor. And so, you know, we we at one point were holding a lot of cash for our clients. We're no longer doing that. We're investing in these uh, this little rally that we're having. So. You know, the tech rally is really uh, ramped up as well. Um, and that's interesting because, you know, there's, the signs are there that there's a lot of headwinds ahead, but we're seeing some, at least a temporary rally um, into the, in that. And I want to make sure that everyone's seeing the right screen here. Yeah, we should be seeing that. That was not refreshing for me on my, on my screen. So interest rates. The Federal Reserve made a decision to raise the overnight Fed funds rate in March, on March 16th. They raised that overnight Fed fund rate to 0.4% in 
it was somewhere around 0.2 uh, uh, or so their rates of a quarter point. And uh, this is the first of many. And they have been forecasting through various speeches and so forth that um, you know they're going to continue to do that and they may do it quickly. And they're doing that because they're trying to tame inflation. And so uh, th that in raising interest rates in addition to potentially unwinding the balance sheet because the Federal Reserve has been propping up the stock market for several years. And they did that most recently during the pandemic by purchasing um, uh, different types of bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And that was flushing the market with liquidity. And that's causing uh, those stock prices to stay propped up or go higher. They have ended that. And that will, we don't know when, but in the May meeting, we suspect that they will announce what they're going to do to unwind that balance sheet. That will have a negative impact on stocks. So what's a bear market? You know, I've mentioned that once before, a bear market. Well, that bear, a bear market is when we see a decline from the peak of an index to a trough of more than 20%. And if you recall, we didn't initially have a bear market in the S&P 500 index, but we did in the NASDAQ composite, and we certainly did in the Russell 2000 index composite there. So we are in bear market territory for a number of different indexes, and this is concerning. We don't get out of that bear market territory until we break through the previous highs, and we are a long ways away from that, uh, about 12% or so for the NASDAQ and small caps, uh, probably another 8%. Now, the S&P 500 did not get into bear market to ter territory. We didn't get into correction territory, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, that's a decline of more than 10%. Uh, what most people realize is, is that since 1929, with the Great Depression, there have been 17 bear markets. And we're talking about just the S&P 500. Now, on average, a bear market starts every five and a half years. The average decline is 37%. And it takes, on average, about 16 months to reach the bottom. And then it takes about another 42 months to recover on all. This is the averages. So peak to bottom to recovery takes almost five years. So modern portfolio theory, which is what the majority of the financial industry operates on, says that we should not have a bear market. Uh, at least Professor Markowitz says we should not have a bear market, but once every 300 years. And you can see here we've had 17 in the last 90 or so. So with 17 bear markets, you know, disproving the theory that so many people follow like dogma, do you think we're going to have another bear market? Do you think another one's coming? Well, we do, and we think it's coming, but we can't time it when it is, but our clients are ready for it. And so let's continue with a, just a little bit of a history lesson um, so we can talk about how bear markets do happen, but they don't need to be endured, okay? So, we know what a bear market is, is the decline. Now, what most of the financial industry is gonna show you is this chart here. From the, from the trough of the bottom of the market on March 9th, 2009, through right before the pandemic hit, the S&P 500 was up 401%. And that's a pretty story, right? Everybody likes to see that. But what they don't tell you is that over time, there are lots of volatility in the market. That's a, you know, we see that big 401% return, that's a great return, but without active risk management, which is what we do in our for our clients, active risk management, you're going to suffer each and every bear market. So let's look at some of these these numbers in history. You know, you had the the run up in the in the dot com boom, you the markets went up 106%. Then you had bear market number 15, I think that was, the markets declined 49%. Then you had bear, uh, a run up of 100% in the next few years, up into the peak. A lot of people don't realize that the, that the financial crisis, actually the market started declining uh, on in October of 2007. Uh, that bear market went down 57%. Then you had this big run up. And then we had the pandemic. And the markets went down in a span of just 30 days, about 34%. That's, that was pretty unnerving. And then you had the run-up since then, 
uh, through the end of uh, the third quarter last year, markets are up 31, uh, 106% since that bottom. Now, we think, and it's pulled back quite a bit since then, so the NASDAQ was down a good um, uh, 12 or 15% still since that peak at, near then. But if you look at this, look at this 10 year period I'm putting on here. If you invested there at the, at the peak there in March of, 20, of 2000, because you didn't wanna miss out. And we see a lot of people get sucked in. When the markets start doing really well, people don't wanna miss out. So they have FOMO, fear of missing out. And so well, you have to be aware of that because in this time frame, in 13 years, the S&P 500 actually made no money. No money. And so what about if we apply this to real life, okay? So we have a fictitious couple. I'll just call them Herb and Myrtle. And in December of 1996, they had about 484,000. They're getting near retirement. And their goal is to uh, have a million dollars when they retire. So as soon as they get a million dollars, they're gonna retire. But some of you may have that same, same goal, but Herb and Myrtle, in March of 2000, uh, just a few years later, had their million dollars. And this is the S&P 500 we're tracking. Then they start with a certain amount of money that they wanna withdraw. Let's say it's 5% or about $50,000 a year. So now they've tapped a hole in their retirement bucket. So it's beginning to drain. They're all happy, that's great. And then you've got bear market number 15, and now they've got two holes in their bucket because they're withdrawing money for their retirement years and their portfolio value is going down. So at the end of, at the bottom of bear market number 15, their million dollar portfolio is only worth about 449,000. But don't worry, as, as the industry says, it'll come back. And it did, um, somewhat. In seven and a half years into retirement, they're still down 33%. The market's recovered, but they're wondering when will they be okay? Because they started with a million dollars just seven, seven years earlier, and they're down by over a third. But at least we plug that hole, right? And we're only withdrawing in the $50,000 a year. But then bear market number 16 happens. We got that hole burst open, bursting open again. Their $667,000 is now $261,000 because remember, they're losing value in the market and they're also losing value because they're spending. Well, you have that big run up and now into this $529,000 is what they've gone back up to. They are, are barely, barely, not even 20, a full 20 years into retirement and they've got about half of what they got left. And then we had uh, the pandemic that dwindled their portfolio and so on with bear market number 17. So in 20 years there, just to finish my story here, 20 years, they've had a return of about 46%, but they've consumed or lost 65% of their portfolio. This is what we call sequence risk. And it doesn't have to happen to you. You don't have to have to endure these bear markets. So why is it so difficult when we lose value in our portfolio? Why is it so hard to get back to where it is? Well, when you lose 10% okay, of your portfolio, you have to gain 11% just to get back to where you are. But when you lose 50%, like it was in some of those bear markets, you've got to earn 100% just to get back to where you started, let alone, let alone replace the money that you're spending every month. That sequence risk is very real. So how long does it take to earn 100%? Well, we just documented in the previous slide that in 20 years, the S&P 500 only returned 65%. They're not even back to where they were because bear markets are real. That sequence risk we talked about is real and long recoveries are real. Losing money is life altering, no doubt. And it should be avoided, not endured, right? Because otherwise you're kind of like this guy. Let's see if I got this picture. Yeah, see, he thinks got, he's got investing and retirement by the tail, but that bear is about to show him who's boss. Would you rather endure this bear attack or would it be wise to avoid it? Are you ready 
for every bear market? That is the question, and that is why we chose to become technical analysts and active managers, trying to protect you from those unseen risks out there. Now, we're not in the prediction business, but we are in the interpretation business because we are presented with the facts and the data that are out there in the market, and we help make portfolio decisions based on those facts, not assumptions about what might happen. And the what might happen is been dictated in the industry by a theory called modern portfolio theory. And quite frankly, in the de last decade, it has not worked. This particular chart is showing you the performance difference between a growth fund, growth allocation fund, and just the cumulative growth in the S&P 500. And the reason for that is, is that certain sectors are going to perform better than others at different points in any given year or even a decade. And what you're seeing here is, is that that portfolio, just a simple index, outperformed the uh, growth allocation fund by over 200% during that time frame. And so why are we putting our assets in things that are underperforming? Well, modern portfolio theory says that if I just own a, a diversified portfolio, that over time they'll do well, but they don't account for the sequence risk and all these different things like that. This is the technology sector. I just show you this because it has had a lot of volatility uh, in the last year, and I need to update this so it shows it for the first quarter uh, because we had a big pullback there. And let's go back to the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve has really propped up the stock market. Let's go back to 2009. And on here, we talk about quantitative easing one. This is where uh, the Federal Reserve started uh, doing types of bond purchases, trying to put liquidity in the market. And you can kind of see with this blue line, the S&P 500 responded favorably to that. Then you get a point where they stop it. Hey, that's enough. Stock market retreats. And um, then the Federal Reserve says, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do some more. Quantitative easing two. And you can follow the S&P 500 as it reacts to different things. And here we are now, uh, this is through 2015, but they've gone on in the pandemic to have quantitative easing. I don't know, I lost count, but buying those mortgage-backed securities and things and, and treasuries, once again, propping up the market. So with all this going on, stock market's down, should I buy the dip? You hear that on television, you hear, news commentators that are supposed experts on these things. And in fact, if you listen to any type of fund provider or investment manager, of course they're going to tell you to buy the dip because this is what lures the amateur investor in. And some of this, we were talking to a, a fellow who invested in some of those meme stocks last year, like GameStop and AMC, you know, they buy on Robinhood, they only have to buy a fraction of the stock. We don't, we don't recommend that because that is a classic example of pump and dump. Someone on social media is trying to pump up the stock to suck you in and only to sell when it gets it to a new high. And the same is true by listening to the pundits on television about, you know, buying the dip. Uh, stocks are cheap. That's what they're going to tell you. You have to be careful because they, un they understand that you are uh, an amateur investor and you're gonna get sucked in because you don't want to miss out. Be wary, be careful about that because we don't want you to fall into that trap and losing money. So we use technical analysis and active management to my, manage our client portfolios. And if you're curious, you wanna, you wanna know, Mark, why, why is um, uh, Harry Markowitz's theory uh, about modern portfolio theory and so widely adopted uh, I encourage you to pick up this book or you can check it out at the library. It's The Misbehavior of Markets. It's, it's written by Benoit Mandelbrot. And it really takes apart modern portfolio theory because modern portfolio theory says that we should not have a bear market, uh, but once every every couple of hundred years or so. And in fact, um, I, I distinctly recall Janet Yellen, who was then um, on the Federal Reserve Board and now is the Secretary of the Treasury, 
under the Biden administration of distinctly telling her, seeing her testify before Congress in 2018 that we will never have a bear market in 300 years. She's buying into the modern portfolio theory Kool-Aid. And sure enough, just less than a year and a half later, we had a bear market. Um, why, is the, why is the industry so set on modern portfolio theory? Well, I believe it's for a couple of reasons. And I illustrate it you know, a little bit with this static pie chart because it's the bear market's favorite meal. Everyone uses this, you know, they use the pie chart, even we do. So here green might be domestic growth, yellow is maybe international or orange, and the blue are bonds. The pie chart is not the problem, the traditional advisor is. The pie charts from traditional advisors have two glaring problems. One, the allocations are usually pro problematic because of expensive or poor performing funds or stock, but the bigger problem for investors like you isn't the allocation. The bigger problem is when markets fail. Why? Well, that's because most advisors have no exit plan. So when in your investments crash, when the markets crash. But why does the industry want to use modern portfolio theory? Well, I have a theory, and this is just my opinion, but I have talked to a number of risk managers at large firms that share the same viewpoint. The reason that modern portfolio theory is, is pushed so heavily on the retail investor is because number one, it allows them to sell you more investments, more mutual funds, because number two, it reduces that investment firm's liability. Because when you get mad and wanna sue them for losing all your money or a big chunk of your money, they can say, well, you told us what to invest in. If you're working with an advisor that's not us, you probably filled out a risk questionnaire, a risk profile where you basically said, what kind of roller coaster am I willing to tolerate? And we all, almost always, we have biases and we almost always overestimate our tolerance for risk. And so we fill out the little five or six question questionnaire that's supposed to tell us everything about ourselves and our tolerance for, for investment risk. And we sign it, we give it to the advisor. And when you get mad, they're gonna pull out that piece of paper and say, well, you told us that you wanted to invest like this. So when the markets crash, so do your investments. The traditional advisor is not going to take action when the markets fall. Your investments just sit there static year after year and they become an easy meal for the bear. Folks, things change. So you have to adapt to that change or you get left behind. And so you wanna make sure that you're investing in the right uh, sectors the right styles and the right sizes of companies in your portfolio. So, you know, we have 11 sectors in the U.S. economy. Uh, the markets are not static. Uh, you know, it's kind of like having a wrestling match. Uh, we use a concept called relative strength. Um, you, just like any championship team, you got to think about who's on your team, who's on the field or the court when you need to do a certain thing. Arm wrestling is kind of similar as well that one of them will gain exposure or gain dominance over the other. And you've, if you've ever seen an arm wrestling match or you've arm wrestled with your kids or someone else, you can know that once you get the momentum, then you can easily complete that. I need to update this, but you know, um, this is last April and here we are in the final four now. And of course my, my team is not in the final four, but we wish all those teams that are good luck. But I, I, I show this illustration because there are several players on this team that if you have to shoot a winning shot, you wanna get the ball in their hands. And there are two or three that you know that and have the confidence that they'll do that. But this fellow here that I've got my laser on here, uh, that's, that's Mark Vidal. And uh, he is a beast on defense, but a horrible three point shooter. And just like your portfolio, us as investment managers or your coach want to make sure that we put the right players on the, on the court of your portfolio uh, at the right time. Uh, our philosophy is kind of similar to Warren Buffett's rules. His rule number one is don't lose the client's money. And rule number two for Warren Buffett is don't forget rule number one. So we're going to move on to technical analysis here and show you a couple of things. We are um, 
well, I think that's probably the end of it. We don't, I'm gonna see if we have any questions or anything. Looks like there's not many questions on the board right now, but someone needs to worry about your portfolio, but it doesn't need to be you because um, we will watch it for you and act. And we encourage you to uh, give us a call. You can get a free consultation um, with that if you have any questions. And that free consultation is complimentary. We're not going to try to sell you anything, but we want to give you peace of mind. You can email us at info at clearvistafinancial.com. That's info at clearvistafinancial.com. Or give us a call at 800-491-4508, 800-491-4508. And if you just want to make an appointment, you can schedule one of those phone consultations by just simply going to my calendar. I put it online. You can see when I'm available. Uh, it, that's at calendly.com forward slash Mark Trice. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty still left in the markets uh, with rising rates, inflation going up. We expect inflation data this next week, and we expect it to be higher than it was year over year from the February data. So markets are going to respond. Of course, we've got geopolitical things going on as well. All those things are going to cause markets to react. You don't have to sit and be a victim. You can take action and make sure that someone is, is being a good steward with your money, that they have a plan to protect your portfolio and your investments when things don't go the way we plan. Uh, I want to thank you for participating in today's webinar. Once again, if you have questions, give us a call. You can send us an email. We'll be happy to help you and just get to know one another. Thanks for joining our webinar. Have a great week.